I would like to formally welcome, formally welcome all of you to MSGA's parallel session that we've had the great honor to organize. I'm Yinwei, the current Shadow Special Operations Officer at UKEC, and I will be your MC for today. Before we start, please do ensure that you're on speaker view to have a better spectating experience. You can change the setting on the top right corner of your screen. So in this parallel session today, we'll be exploring the topic of learning beyond the classroom. We will first start off the session with a presentation, followed by a QA and a with Teach for Malaysia, and then a student panel session with a few student-led organizations, namely the Kalsa Movement, IQ, Charisma Movement, and KPUM. But before we begin, I would like to give a brief introduction and background to UKEC and what we do. So UKEC stands for the United Kingdom and our Council for Malaysian Students in the UK and Ireland. We are the umbrella body and national coalition of Malaysian student societies across the United Kingdom and Ireland. And we serve as an integral platform representing the collective interests of 16,000 Malaysian students. UKEC's mission is to contribute towards nation building by championing our brand of student activism, one that contributes in community development, tackling brain drain, developing employability, strengthening unity, and stimulating non-partisan intellectual discourse. So UKC reaches students across 13 by our 13 regional chairpersons who maintain the relationship between all Malaysian societies and UKC. Is there is there a problem with the slide sharing? Yeah, I think um. So if, if people are sharing in the main room, we can't share our slides. Um, so that's disrupting, but it's okay. I'll just continue to share. Sure. So we are also affiliated with a number of organizations, including the Kalsa Movement, the Hub Movement, MMI, MACFIS, KPUM, IQ, MBIOS, and FSW. So a little bit on our structure, UKEC is made of two councils, which are namely the Supreme Council and the Executive Council. So the Supreme Council consists of all of our Malaysian Society presidents and vice presidents, as well as our affiliates. And our Executive Council consists of the Executive Councillors and the elected 10. So in the Executive Council, we're divided into different offices, which push forward initiatives that are aligned with UKEC's five pillars. Our flagships include Project Amanat Negara, which is our council's longest standing student-led conference, the Malaysian Career Fair, where we connect prestigious Malaysian recruiters to UK talents, impact stories, which aim to inspire the youth by inviting diverse speakers in sharing their journey or success stories, LEAD, that aims to foster better leadership skills amongst the students, and the Malaysian Student Leader Submit, where we aim to raise awareness on critical matters amongst the bright young minds of Malaysia with key industry figures. So besides that, regional events are also held across the year to decentralize what UKEC has to offer to the Malaysian community in the UK and Ireland. This includes our regional career events, coffee and conversations, as well as care for alls. Some of our other initiatives also include the exclusive corporate luncheon, Cherku articles, the language and cultural classes, and SSIF. So moreover, here at UKEC, we are motivated to provide support to the 16,000 Malaysian students in the UK and Ireland where we can. For example, when the COVID-19 pandemic first hit, we managed to raise enough funds to provide 25 Malaysian students to return home during the height of the pandemic. We also, we also collaborated with EM Malaysia to distribute health packages to Malaysian students during the lockdown period and creating a concise travel guide for those who intend to fly home or to the UK. So if you like what you're hearing so far, you may be interested to join us and lucky you. UKEC is about to launch our recruitment drive for the next council of 2021-22. So if you're an incoming student studying the, study in the UK, an opportunity is up for grabs. Our recruitment drive will launch in September and close, closes early October. There'll be three stages in our recruitment drive. First, we would ask for you to answer a few questions followed by a task based on the office you have chosen. And finally, an interview. So here at UKC, we have a diverse range of opportunities that you can be exposed to. We have seven offices in the Executive Council, so there's definitely something for everyone. 
So a little more on the respective offices. The chair's office is the advocacy and activism arm of UKEC, where we try to champion change and encourage the youth to play a part in shaping our nation. We also ensure the continuous development and engagement with student societies in the UK and Ireland. The Secretariat and Strategy Office is the internal engine of UKEC, keeping the council to a high standard of administration, organization, and effectiveness. The Treasury Office is the financial arm of UKEC, ensuring smooth execution and monetary sustainability through budgeting, reimbursement, and sponsorizing. The Catalyst Office is the intellectual arm of UKEC, which aims to provide platforms for discourse within the student population through its initiatives such as Checo Articles, Project Amanat Nagara, and Coffee and Conversations. The Careers Office is the employability arm of UKEC, driven to tackle the brain drain in Malaysia. The Careers Office wants to increase and maximize the opportunities for Malaysian students and graduates in the UK and IR by providing them with internship and employment opportunities, as well as pushing initiatives where students can upskill themselves. The charity well-being and volunteering arm of UKC, looking after students' welfare throughout the year, is none other than the CARES office. So the CARES office is always motivated to provide the right resources and organize events to take care of the well-being of all Malaysian students in the UK and Ireland. And lastly, the Connect office is the branding and marketing arm of UKEC, ensuring continuous accessibility of events and resources to the student population. This office revamps and maintains UKEC's websites and social media platforms. So if you are a fresher or an incoming student in the UK, or if you have any relatives or friends coming to the UK for their studies next term, do spread the word and keep a lookout for our recruitment drive. What are you waiting for? Join us now. So I'd like to extend our gratitude towards MSGA once again for inviting UKEC to host this session with a topic that I'm sure most of us as university students will be keen to learn more about. With the fast changing landscape of the job market in a post pandemic world, education is deemed the key to constantly adapt and try. It goes without saying that learning is far beyond textbooks and exams, which includes personal growth, hard and soft skills, core values, building networks to enhance self-development and employability. Therefore, our session entitled Learning Beyond the Classroom features guest speakers from various organizations and student-led organizations involved in social services and career development to provide insights into how students can achieve their own personal development goals by maximizing their time and experience in university. We hope by the end of this session, you'll be able to gain three things. So first is to see the range of opportunities out there for you, to hear from the people behind these opportunities and their motivations, and to leave inspired to take up some of these opportunities yourself. But before I introduce our first speaker, I'd like to invite everyone for a quick photo session, which I'll pass over to Jingyi from MSGA to take the screenshot. So if everybody could turn on their cameras for yeah. a quick photo session. So I'll wait for 30 seconds for everyone to on their cams. So, okay, I'll go with the first page first. So, ready? Three, two, one, smile. Okay, and the second page. Three, two, one, smile. And the third page. Three, two, one. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So, our first speaker today is Ms. Chu Mei Yi, who is the head of coaching and support at Teach for Malaysia. Ms. Mei oversees the program Teach for Malaysia Fellows to nurture high quality teachers and leaders. Prior to joining Teach for Malaysia, her experiences included being a high school math teacher in Kansas City through the Teach for America program, and she obtained her undergraduate and master's degree in the States and returned back to Malaysia in 2015. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Mei to shed some light on our topic today, learning beyond the classroom. Ms. Mei, over to you. 
Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thank you again for the invitation uh, to share with all of you today. Uh, it's truly an honor and privilege. Um, so yeah, as uh, was introduced, my name is Mei and um, I'm the head of coaching and support. What that means is I oversee the program, the training program for our fellows uh, who become teachers for two years uh, in Malaysian high need schools. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, just checking if uh, you're able to see my screen. Yep. Yep, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a, it's a really big topic. And I think, um, as, especially for university students, as you're thinking a lot about, you know, your career, your future, um, hopefully uh, this presentation or this uh, session will, will uh, be uh, useful for you and I think really want it to be quite engaging and practical so I'm going to be asking you to share uh, some things in the chat uh, if you feel comfortable uh, just so that because I think it's really important that we are actively engaging in in uh, sessions okay so we're going to start with uh, one question so um, with the topic right learning beyond the classroom I want us to think about what is uh, one of your most memorable learning experience. So it could be learning a skill, uh, like riding a bicycle, for example, or a knowledge, uh, right, content, uh, or it could be a life lesson, like, oh, don't, uh, like, something about, um, you know, never give up. Uh, so something that you learned from outside the classroom. Um, if you can just share in the chat, what was it and what was the experience like? So I'll just give us, like, two minutes to, to share something um, in the chat. Doesn't have to be super profound, can be simple, just something that you is memorable, a learning experience that was memorable for you. Okay, Chris has shared that uh, learn a lot from teaching Mama refugees at the learning center. It's great. Okay, wow. Someone uh, learned how to do CPR for person under cardiac arrest. Uh, yeah, learning to be kind. Mm. Okay. <laughs> learning to skip backwards. Yep, interesting. First aid. Wow, and actually having to practice the first aid, that's great. Okay, learning to manage some events. And I think even through managing events, you learn a lot about, uh, you know, maybe it's learning how to use Excel sheets or learning how to work with people um, or, you know, small things like how to use Zoom, for example, right? Um, so a lot of goes into, into managing events. Yeah, harsh realities of the working world. Okay, last few seconds. Mm. Okay, some of you have experienced teaching or working with different communities. All right. Okay, I'm going to move on, but please continue to share um, your, your memorable learning experience. But I think the point is quite obvious that the idea of you know, learning definitely doesn't just happen in the classroom. Um, and, and I think as you guys have shared, a lot of it comes from different experiences, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, volunteering or your internships or just living life, right? Being kind to other people and things like that. Uh, and, and I think that that's um, a little bit about what I'll be talking about today. So um, at Teach for Malaysia, we have what we call this student learning vision. Um, if I could get a brave soul to just read this statement in blue, uh, with gusto. You can just read it like with your best voice, um, read the whole statement. You can just get one person to do that.
uh, I can do it. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Is that Cynthia? I okay. know. <laughs> Sorry. I know what I've learned so far and where I am at now. <laughs> I know what I want to learn and I am aware of how much I need to progress. I know who can help me and what I can do to get to where I want to. Yeah. Great. That's fine. Thank you so Yay. much. Cynthia. Thank you for your courage as well for coming off mute. So yes, um, this statement here is kind of what we, we call a student learning vision, right? Which is essentially like what, we, what we're aspiring students to be able to articulate on their own. Um, and there are essentially kind of three parts to this statement, right? There's, um, there's this part about, you know, you know what, um, where you are and where you're going um, and what you're actually learning, like what's the purpose of it? And you're aware of your progress and your growth. And I think finally, the part about, you know who are the people around you that can help me. And that's really honing in the idea that the journey of learning and life is not meant to be done on your own. And it's really about um, knowing and leveraging on the resources around you. Asking for help um, is not a, a, a measure of weakness, but it's a measure of community. And I think especially in this world that is, you know, gets more and more complex, uh, we need people around us who can support us in our journey. So um, we kind of break this down to three parts, the importance of having goals, um, right? Just having like clear goals, like what, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Um, and then how do you always uh, monitor your progress and your, and your, your progress towards your goals? And finally, uh, like I said earlier, this idea of like, what's your strategy? Like, do you have, do you know what the resources that you have around you and are you leveraging on them? And resources here can mean people. It can also mean things, right? Like libraries or like what internet resources, what websites are actually helpful for you um, and which ones are not actually, right? Because now, right nowadays, there's, there's like a kind of overload of stuff. But I also really want to point out um, that what you, what, something you see that's a similarity across the board is this idea of awareness, um, right? Awareness, awareness, and awareness. Um, so I think this idea of awareness is, is that you, you, it's always coming from a place of uh, reflection, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and so just want to hone in sort of like this idea of learning is not just about, okay, I have the knowledge and that's all, but really like how do you zoom out and see the progress that you've made so far and celebrate that and, and, and then always looking to how do you grow in your journey and how do you grow in your personal uh, development, right? So when we talk about what are key elements of learning, I think there are two, if I were to dilute it to two key, key components. The first is actively engaging. Um, so I've chosen this sort of icon because it's like theater, right? Like those of you who've been in like a theater kind of class, you have to put your whole self into it um, to really engage in that, right? And it's, it's not just like your body, but also your emotions, um, and, and all aspects, all your senses and all your emotions. And I think that that's what learning is really about when you can put your whole self in it, your full attention um, and really just um, and, and, and engaging your, your um, all aspects of who you are in the learning. I think that's the most important. So for example, when you say going for a volunteer uh, opportunity, you know, putting your whole self in it is not just that like, I'm here to tick off the box. Okay, I've done the task, but you know, are you looking around the environment, engaging with your senses and, you know, getting to know the people around you um, and, and really taking on that full experience? So, you know, even like all of you students, you know, university is not just about going to class and learning from the textbook. Like you could probably, if that was all to it, you could, you could do that uh, through like YouTube videos and Wikipedia. But there's so much more to the university experience that that, that makes it a holistic experience, right? Like, you know, all of you participating in uh, co-curricular activities, the friends that you make, um, getting to know the culture of the people around you and things like that. So I think that that's what learning is about to fo focus not just on what is the topic at hand, but also the entire experience that the learning experience gives to you. And, and along with that is this idea of reflection, like I said, right? We only gain awareness when we give ourselves time to reflect. And I really believe that reflection is a skill. It is something that you can develop over time with practice. Um, and, and I really believe that, that growth can only happen or development can only happen when we are constantly reflecting um, on ourselves um, and, and, and thinking about, you know, where am I right now? where do I need to go? So this idea of awareness, as I shared earlier, 
right? So talking about reflection, um, it, it can be very, very simple, uh, as simple as five minutes a day, right? And it can be, you know, all sorts of questions. If you just click Google like daily reflection questions, you'll find like a ton of them uh, online. Um, but here, here are just some examples. So I'm actually going to ask us to uh, do a little bit of reflection to practice this and to hopefully show you how simple it can be. Um, so for I'm going to give us like three minutes or maybe two, three minutes actually. Um, pick one or two questions that I have here to reflect on and then share your responses in the chat if you feel comfortable to do so. Okay, so just three minutes on the clock and just reflect on any of these questions that you want to reflect on. The questions are on the slide here, these eight questions. But you just pick, pick one or two. Are people seeing the right slide or is it just Cheng, Cheng Mons? Are people able to see the questions? I think it might be a me problem. I, do, I can only see the slide we got from the previous breakout room, not the current one. Okay, I can just do a copy of the questions on the chat. Yes. Yeah, I see some reflections coming in. Thank you. Okay, last ten seconds. Great. Okay, again, you know, if you have more uh, reflections to share, please continue to do that in the chat. But I think the whole point that I was trying to make here is that it, it's very simple. Um, it can be something you do while sitting in the toilet or, um, you know, brushing your teeth or um, walking, taking a, a short walk. But this whole idea of reflection is just a way to gain more awareness about ourselves. And I think hopefully what I wanted to see is like, by sharing your reflections, um, sometimes it's also listening to the reflection of other people that you get inspired. Um, and again, that's this idea of like, life is not meant to be lived on your own, right? You, you, you need to have a community around you. And sometimes sharing reflections um, is a great way to kind of uh, help each other journey through whatever we're going through. Um, so yeah, thanks for participating for all the of all of you who shared and yeah please continue to share that uh share your reflections as well if you'd like so just a, a a really quick sharing about um you know i think a main part of today was also to share like the importance of having a volunteering experience i think my point here is to to also be courageous to engage in diverse experiences 
So it doesn't always have to be related to your degree and your major, um, especially nowadays when the world is, is so diverse, um, you may not end up doing uh, a job that, you know, that is related to your career. So for example, uh, what you see here is during my second year of university in the US, um, I actually volunteered at, uh, at uh, uh, it's an organization called uh, Heifer International, but they have a ranch, uh, like a farm. Um, and so uh, they, um, so actually I was like a tour guide for people who came to this, to this farm. Um, and, and through that experience, I, I learned a lot of things. Uh, firstly, I made a lot of friends of all ages. So for example, this is a very old couple who, who I have learned a lot from uh, through their friendship and, and also, you know, small things like I learned how to ride a golf cart because I had to do that as part of my, uh, you know, touring, uh, touring job. I also learned how to butcher, butcher chickens because that was part of the, you know, the farm life. We, the, the food we ate in the cafeteria was from the farm. So we had to learn how to, you know, butcher chickens or how to rear chickens, you know, move the, move the hen cage and stuff like that. Things that, you know, otherwise um, in my typical education sort of, uh, work life I probably may not have experienced but I think it's really just about you know you don't have to you don't have to always do internships or um, or or volunteering things that are only related to your degree I think university life is the best time to really just explore other things of course uh, having experience within your field is, is important but I think to also balance it with other things that may not be directly related to your degree um, which will give you sort of a diverse experience and an edge potentially to other to uh, compare it to other people. So I think just a, a few uh, tips about, you know, maybe some of you would say like, oh, but it, it's kind of like out of my comfort zone and how would I do that? I think the, the, the first thing you want to keep in mind is always be clear about your why or your purpose. Uh, like, so for example, if the purpose is to get diverse experience, you know, then center on that and focus on that. And secondly, again, the point about reflection, but reflection also, uh, and being honest about what are the barriers that might be stopping you. Um, it could be maybe you feel fearful or that you might fail, uh, or you might feel that, oh, you're not good at that. It's not your strength, right? Things like that. But and, and so that it's just like first gaining awareness about what are these barriers, and then you can kind of work to overcome them. But first, it must come, like I said, with an awareness of yourself, right? And like I said, the third, that, like I've emphasized with this third point as well, that a, a really great way to overcome, to help you overcome barriers is to having, is, is to having a, su a supportive uh, community to journey with you, to encourage you when you feel, when you doubt yourself or when you feel you can't do it uh, and, and things like that. So I think it's, it's, these are sort of three pointers that I would uh, emphasize when thinking about how do I step out of my comfort zone. So I think lastly, just to end here, um, of course, Teach from Malaysia is an organization that we've been around for about 10 years now. Um, there are multiple opportunities with us when it comes to, uh, you know, as university students. So you can join us as uh, interns um, or you can be a campus leader. Um, yeah, you can check out our website or the links are uh, here in the QR code. Uh, we are also launching a new tutoring program, uh, hopefully next uh, month or yeah, in, a, in about a week or so. So if you'd like to volunteer as a tutor for our tutoring program, uh, do check out our social media for, for more information. Um, and you can find uh, yeah, all our social media accounts here. So yeah, I think that's all in terms of my sharing. I hope it was uh, uh, both practical um, and also uh, helpful. And yeah, I think feel free to ask me any questions um, after this. All right, thank you, Ms. May, for your lovely presentation. We'll now move on to the Q&A session. So to the audience, if you have any questions, please, uh, wait, I'll wait for my, please feel free to scan the QR code that my colleague will be sharing her screen later or click on the link in the chat box where you'll be directed to slido.com. You can put in your question there or upvote any questions you want to be directed to our speaker. And this will be a moderated session by my colleague, Genru. So I'll now pass the floor over to her. All right. Um, thank you, Yinwei, and thank you, Ms. Mei, for your speech and wonderful insights. So greetings to everyone tuning into today's session. We are thrilled to have you join us. So my name is Yenru, the Shadow VC of Careers, and I will be moderating the upcoming Q&A session. So if we may, um, I'll first start off with a few questions of my own, then we will move on to the questions from our wonderful audiences on Slido. So 
First question to Ms. May. Um, you were a fellow in America before becoming the head of coaching today. So what keeps you motivated to stay in Teach for Malaysia? Yeah, okay. Um, so I've been in Teach for Malaysia since I came back in 2015. So this would be my seventh or eighth year. Um, there are many reasons, but I think obviously besides the vision of you know helping uh, students and, and inequity. I think our larger mission at Teach for Malaysia is really to develop uh, leaders, Malaysians, uh, to become leaders who will continue to impact education. And I think over the last uh, few years, I have, I have seen the, the impact of that. Um, you know, if you were to ask me 10 years ago before I came back to Malaysia, I think the, the NGO or the, the social enterprise scene is probably quite... Um, quite scarce but now 10 years later um, there are a lot more NGOs there are a lot more social enterprises that are education related now of course it's not just due to teach from Malaysia of course there are many many attributes that that, that um, contribute to that but I think I, I can confidently say that many of the teach from Malaysia alumni um, and people who come through the movement have been uh, a part of growing that that uh, that scene. And I think that that is essentially what the mission is, right? To really see people um, grow into positions or to, to grow into continuing to contribute, you know, commit their lives to, to supporting the social sector, not just the education sector, but the social sector in, in Malaysia. And I think that's really one. And I think the second thing, uh, I, another thing is, um, I really think that Teach for Malaysia is one uh, one organization that really brings Malaysians from all walks of life um, um, into one body, which I think is quite rare in Malaysia. I think a lot of times in Malaysia, um, many organizations or you know companies are quite segregated by race or socioeconomic status and things like that. Um, but because we are centered on the on the on the on the vision, um, we you know we really see fellows from all walks of life. Um, you know, all, all, all races and, and they come together and build long lasting relationships. And I think that's really, for me, what my ideal Malaysia, as I would say, um, I, I get to see that um, as part of my work. And so that these are the things that motivate me. Yeah. Okay, that's also a very inspiring answer. <laughs> so um, moving on, second question. So I understand that Teach for Malaysia also aims to, you know, reduce education inequality. So with the pandemic, people of different social economic groups have been impacted differently, and this is undoubtedly translated into the classroom as well. So can you briefly outline how education inequality has been exacerbated by our current circumstances, and how has Teach for Malaysia changed their approach to accommodate these students? Yeah. yeah. Um... That question itself is probably a, a whole topic on its own. <laughs> in, a, in a quick summary, you know, as you can imagine, number one is um, there is a part about just the education, right? The aspect of education that the access to education obviously has not been equal. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, people in the B forty communities um, have not been able to access education. Uh, just lack of devices and and um, connectivity. Um, and even if they have devices, you know, whether they have the conducive environment to learn is another question, right? A lot of our B40 families, they live in homes that have a lot of people um, and, and you just don't have a quiet space to, to join your class and, and be so focused for hours um, uh, to, to, to learn. And, and so that's like kind of from the education side of things. And then, and then you have the sort of economical or uh, societal ch challenges, right? So for a lot of these families, um, getting food on the table on a daily basis has become the concern uh, for a lot of parents who've lost their daily wage jobs, you know, for the, the sector has been closed. So many sectors have been closed for so long um, that many of the people who are suffering are, are the ones who are the daily wage workers. So their parents are not bringing home uh, the, you know, the, the, the income. And so the children have to step in, uh, you know, whether it's becoming grab drivers and things like that, or um, yeah, it, it's just, Education then becomes the, the, the back, the, the optional thing, right? Because right now, survival is the first thing. So I think that's another aspect that it really affects. Um, so, I mean, for us, 
we we have chosen to focus more on the learning part because I think we you know as naturally we can't dabble into everything and I think there are a lot of efforts and support supporting the 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 economical side of things as well so we we have focused a bit more on the the learning side of things so I think number one is just uh really equipping teachers um on how to transition to to teaching online you know last year it was a new experience for lots and lots of people so we actually developed uh, a microsite in partnership with uh, Bain and company uh, if you just google tfm distance learning um it's a it's like a resource site where people can find some guidelines about you know how do you how do you teach uh, online and focusing not just on the the learning of like content but also on like social emotional learning and how do you help people manage their emotions during such times um and we've also uh, uh, started this initiative with uh, called the Learning Box, um, where where we are sending learning materials that are very engaging uh, to to more rural communities so that they can have some form of learning experience um, during the pandemic. Um, and the third thing uh, would be we've also partnered with YTL Foundation uh, to create these self guided lessons online. Um, so we we found that there wasn't really a repository. Uh, of like materials that are not videos and stuff like not high bandwidth kind of materials um, that follows the curriculum. So if you just Google YTL Learn From Home, uh, you'll find the website, it's, it's available for free and it, it, it follows the curriculum of uh, core subjects. We're growing, we're growing more lessons, but um, that's something else we part participated in um, uh, last year and continuing to do so this year. All right, since so like Teach from Malaysia is doing a lot. So um, thank you for that. So I think um, there are a lot of students who are, you know, very excited here to engage with you. So I think we'll start off with receiving questions from Slido. So the first question from the floor is, what advice could you give for people that still don't have a goal for life or who are still unsure about the future? Yeah. I think the first the first thing is number one, don't worry. Uh, it's not it's not a problem, right? Okay? And I think firstly, also another point is that I think oftentimes we are trying to find the right answer to questions like this. You know, what is my purpose in life? This very big question. What's my goal? And I want to find the right answer that that I will hold on to for a long time. Um, the reality is that. That right answer probably doesn't exist. I think my life philosophy is that you probably have 10 right answers. All of them are good. Whichever you take, it's going to be okay. And it's more about how do you make the most of that experience. Um, so for example, you know, if you ask me when I was a university student, I say, okay, 10 years from now, I'm going to be a senior manager in, in this organization. Like definitely no, right? Um, and I think it's, it's just this idea of like, how do you... Um, you know, in any decision you make, you make it centered on core values that you have. Are they aligned to your values? Are they aligned to your needs at that point? And, and just kind of take that step forward. So your goals sometimes, you know, sometimes people like to ask like, well, what's your goal in 10 years from now, five years from now? That's just an exercise to help you think bigger. Um, but you don't have to get too worried about, I got to find that right answer. Um, and, and, you know, and the reality is it's going to change. Um, maybe you know in a few months a few years from now and that's okay i think that's is that is essentially what life's journeys and adventures about if you always knew your life plan 10 years from now it wouldn't be exciting um so i think firstly is to not worry about getting the right answer you probably already have five answers and they're all good and all of them will will you know just pick one try it for now and then if you if, uh, yeah, much i'm really not this is not not actually the right one and now you just tried another one like you know that I think that the, the paths to life, there are many paths and you just kind of, the, I think more important is the process of life that you go through. Um, but I mean, of course, when it comes to setting goals, there are a lot of other resources around that. Like I said, you know, there, there are a lot of resources online about how do you reflect on things that matter to you that help you craft your goals. Sometimes talking to with people, you know, there are coaches or counsellors or just even friends, you know, that help you process your thoughts. Um, yeah, I think that, that would be sort of like a little bit of what I would say um about about that question yeah all right um next question so recently people have been complaining about the white savior complex and joining volunteer trips just to boost ego what are your thoughts on it yeah um so 
it def- I mean, that definitely exists. And of course, you know, nowadays, especially when universities say like, oh, you know, volunteer opportunities boost your resume and things like that. Of course, those exist. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's really about you and your intentions and knowing why you do it. Uh, no one else is going to be able to see or judge that. So I think number one is to very, be, like, you know, like what I said, be clear about your why. Why are you doing this? And to be honest, maybe boosting your resume is part of it, right? Um, but it cannot be your main purpose. If that's your main purpose, you won't get the most out of the experience. Yeah, you could take it off and you could get it done, but you wouldn't be, like I said, putting your whole self in the experience. Um, so I think it's for you, for you yourself to be very clear about why you're doing it. Are you doing it because your mother told you or you know, your counselor told you or you know, or like, oh yeah, this career person said it's good to do it. Um, or is it because you really want to learn and really want to help and really want to gain the experience? Like I said, that is something you have to like kind of be clear with yourself. Um, and then of course, you know, can we judge other people also? No, you, you don't know why they're doing it at the end of the day, right? Um, and I think it's just to, to help each other, a community again to say like, hey, oh, you know, keep each other in check. Like, hey, why are you doing this? Are your intentions uh, for good purpose and are your intentions right? Um, and, and even right and wrong, I mean, some people will argue that there are a lot of subjective ways to view that. But I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's really you yourself and do you know why you're doing it? Um, and to, to just center on that um, and make sure you're doing it for what you believe are the right reasons. Now. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if you, you know, just focus on doing things just for your CV and resume, I think it can get very tiring and you can get burnt out really quickly. So next question, um, there's an increasing emphasis on soft skills now. So what soft skills should I focus on developing? Um, I don't, I don't know if there's sort of a right answer to that. I think the whole idea of soft skills is that they are not so specific, right? Um, I think if I were to emphasize one, um, and this might be because a bit more of my personality, but I think for me, something that has really helped is, um, just relationship building and taking the initiative to build relationships. Um, I think at the end of the day, the whole part of soft skills is how do you relate with people and how do you how how do you work with a group of human beings right and people and and unfortunately it's a very hard thing because we are such unique and diverse um in our ways and um and i think that yeah i think if i were to just focus on one thing it's just um being intentional about building relationships um and and um yeah being proactive to do that um whether it's yeah, just starting conversations with people um, or taking initiative to organize things that bring people together. I think those things will, will really help you grow a lot of your skills. Um, I know it takes a lot of courage, especially for people who are not extroverted, um, you know, but it, it can be very small, like just say, hey, like, let's have a meal together uh, with one other person, you know, take the initiative to, 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 to meet up with people and, and uh, ask people real questions about life and, and I think to me, those are the things that will help you relate with people. And I really find that as you, as you gain more awareness about others, that also helps you gain awareness about yourself. Um, it's true conflicts with other people that you realize like, oh, actually, this is something that's a pet peeve of mine. Or this is something that is, you know, uh, something that's very important to me. It's only through relationships and conflicts that we, that we gain this kind of information about ourselves. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um... Next question. So I joined clubs and organizations which gave purposeful experience during this pandemic, but eventually my great job. Is there any advice you'd like to give? I think this is more of a like, you know, due to time constraints, there's only, you know, so much you can do. Yeah. Yeah. And and precisely, I think, remember that you are a human being with 100% limited capacity. Um, and it's always about being intentional about where you're spending your time um, and not trying to do too much. I think in the world nowadays where it's so easy to access um, a lot of different things, we want to do everything. Um, but I think we have to be really intentional about our time um, so that you can protect your sanity as well, right? So things like sleep, things like sleep, your well-being, that must be the forefront. Um, and it, that cannot be, I know, I know university students like to brag like, oh, I only slept four hours, you know, I finished my assignment. Like, maybe you can do that when you're young, but 
as you go, it will actually have detrimental effects. Lah. I think you also know, right? If you do that in the long run, it will affect you uh, in the future. And, you, you know, you, you've heard all these stories about people who overwork and, and then like, you know, they either pass away or like later on they have complications. So like all these things, it's, it's really about making sure you, uh, you, you have, um, you're always checking your capacity. Uh, again, that comes through reflection. Right, where's your energy today? How much energy? What drains your energy? What gives you energy? Um, all of this comes through reflection and awareness. Then you can adjust. Um, so I think another advice is like, okay, if you went and again, like, you know, don't beat yourself up too much. Like, I oh, I have a great job because I did it. Like, life is life is all about journey, right? So like, okay, you realize my grade has dropped. So ne- therefore, you know, you need to adjust something for the next semester. Uh, so I think life is just about a constant cycle of, of growth and improving. Don't beat yourself up over mistakes you've made. Um, and, and, you know, if you realize something, then do what, what do the necessary small shift that you need. Maybe it's dropping one commitment um, or, you know, to, so that you can have a more balanced uh, life uh, and things like that. So I, I think that those are just yeah, a few things to that question. Right. Okay. Um... I think due to time constraint, we can only have one more question. So are there any part-time volunteering opportunities in Teach for Malaysia? Yeah. So like I shared earlier, typically, actually, we don't. Um, uh, we only typically have the internship or the campus leader opportunity. Um, but uh, but next week onwards, we will be having this uh, tutoring program. So uh, there, hopefully, there'll be, uh, we'll be launching that, that opportunity soon. So you can check that on our social media yeah all right that's it that's the time we have for questions so thank you to the audience for being so engaging and thank you miss me for sharing so much i think um one of the things you mentioned a lot was reflecting and being intentional with whatever you do so i think that's a very um big take back on my side so i will now pass it back to yinwei and thank you once again so much miss me so over to you yinwei Right. Thank you so much, Ms. May and Yenru for that session. It was truly insightful. So moving on, I'll now like to call upon our amazing lineup of student panelists from different organizations to tell us more about their respective experiences being an active committee member. So while we wait for the screen to be shared. So first we have with us Hafiz from the Kalsum Movement, who is the Kalsum Harapan Director he has conducted several camps, including an education camp for Yayasan Chowkit children, preparation camps for exchange students, and the latest one, Kalsum Harapan Camp for rural B40 high school students. He's also passionate about emerging industries and innovative ideas, being involved in case study competitions and entrepreneurship programs to explore his said passion. So secondly, we have Wei Yang, who is the head of region for IQ UK 2021-22. He's an incoming second year civil engineering, civil and environmental engineering student studying at Imperial College London. And as the UK head of region at IQ International, Weyang oversees the planning and execution of regional initiatives, such as IQ's flagship event, Chipta. He's also constantly involved in managing and engaging with the regional stakeholders. Next, we have Tham Chen Tian, who is the co-executive director of Charisma Movement, also known as Yuan. He is a second year economics student at the University of Warwick and a passionate individual in social service and enrichment opportunities. Yoon was the Inspire Initiative Director during his first year in Charisma Movement and was responsible for facilitating the planning of Yana Project, a breast and ovarian cancer awareness campaign. He was also a project volunteer of CM's Wildlife Conservation Project 2020, which brought youth to the Terengganu to study the local wildlife and environmental sustainability. And lastly, we have Haja from KPUM, who is an incoming second year law student at Oxford University. As the Director of Corporate Relations and Outreach at KPUM, she's emotionally invested in Malaysian politics, constitutionality, and policy making. So I would now like to invite Hafiz to start off this session. Hafiz, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yinwei. So uh, to start with, let me explain to you what is the cause of movement. Next slide, please. Okay, the Council Movement started from a donation drive by four students studying in UK to help a struggling mother. Her name is Puan Kaltum and, and her families. So from this donation drive, 
it snowballs into to become the oldest student-led charity movement in Malaysia, focusing and specializing on tackling education inequality in Malaysia. The council movement has been listed in Malaysia books of records for the longest running student-led motivational camp in Malaysia as well. And uh, to date, we have benefited more than 4,000 beneficiaries since uh, the organization establishment in 1994. So in the council movement, a lot of our activities, a lot of our events, it revolve around four main council pillars, which are English language proficiency. We want to emphasize on the importance of English language to our beneficiaries. Second, development of academic and non-academic skills. We believe that students need, aside from academic skills, our beneficiaries need to be equipped, equipped with non-academic skills such as public speaking uh, and so on. Third, exposure to post-secondary education opportunities. In all our events or in, or in the majority of our events, we will expose them to a lot of uh, all the scholarships, all the uh, tertiary pathways that might not be available to them or might not be exposed to these beneficiaries in on, on their own. And lastly, to nurture the custom spirit. We want our facilitators, we want the committees, we want the all the stakeholders, whether it be the beneficiaries or the facilitators to become the agent of change. After undergoing the camps, we want them to realize that they have so much potential, that they, there is so much more skills that they can explore. And because of that, they can be the agent of change in their own separate and respective communities. So that's the cause of movement in general. Next slide. Okay, uh, let me share you about my experience uh, joining the council movement. I joined council movement in 2017 as the facilitator. In one of my uh, pre-university class, my teacher promote the, the program to me and I, uh, for me like, I think let's join, there's no, uh, there's no things to lose. There's uh, events that I can learn how to uh, manage events and module. So, uh, because of that, I joined the first ever Entrepreneurship and Innovation Camp, EIC, in 2017. The camp focused on developing and nurturing entrepreneurship mindset, business mindset amongst its beneficiaries, consisting of about 80 participants from rural uh, B40 community. This is the my first uh, engagement with the Carlson Movement, and that's how I learned about the Carlson Mindset, the camaraderie, the moment you join the camp, the moment you're engaged with the community, with the beneficiaries, it is as if you, you yourself are empowered because of all the hype and all the support the community and the other facilitators give you. So not just you're helping the, the beneficiaries, everyone help each other to form a, a huge support system. And from this kind of support system, we see an increase of performance in all stakeholders, whether it be committees, facilitators, or beneficiaries. An example that I can give you is that one of my uh, group uh, beneficiaries, she went from shy and not knowing what to do to be a, being able to do a public speaking in front of a hundred audience of a hundred people in just a, in just a matter of three days. So there's a huge improvement, and there's a uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, one minute, sir. And second. My second informant is the flagship program, Project Castle Motivational Camp as a facilitator. Similar things happen as my previous camp as well. And my recent involvement is as a camp director for Castle Harapan 2021. I will explain it a, a bit further in the next slide. Okay, what is the skills? What are the skills that can be learned? I will explain from two sides. As a facilitator, you learn how to create module plans, a module plans. You are trained to engage with the beneficiaries, how to engage with shy beneficiaries, how to engage with hyperactive beneficiaries. You learn how to support them. You learn how to empower them. You learn how to create module tailored for the, these kind of beneficiaries. You learn risk assessment, how to time your activities by stages, how to make contingency plans in case of uh, unexpected events. And one challenge that is unique to the pandemic, how to make your module interact, interesting and interactive especially when a lot of your beneficiaries are camera shy and are, they hardly 
engage with you, how to make it interesting. So that's the main challenge as a facilitator. And as a director, uh, the general project management and due to the time's up, I think, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. You, you can ask me later about this. And next slide, that's all for me, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, I guess I'll take over from here. So my name is Wei Yang, and I'm the UK Head of Region from IQ International. So next slide. So this will be the content of my presentation today. I'll begin with a little introduction to what IQ and is and what we do. Then I'll continue to talk about um, what really attracts me to join extracurricular activities as I speak about our flagship event, Chipta. Next, I'll talk about values I've personally gained throughout my time here. And last but not least, how to be involved in such opportunities. So yeah, next slide. To give you more context of one IQ does. So IQ is a non-profit student organization focused on fostering entrepreneurship and innovation amongst Malaysian students. Through our initiatives, we hope to equip students with the knowledge to be able to go from just an idea to delivering a market-ready product. Yeah, next slide. So what exactly attracted me to join extracurricular activities beyond the classroom? So why do I bother to join them? Well, I believe every student organization out there they all have one very similar interest, which is to give back to the Malaysian community in their own ways through various initiatives. So as for IQ, there's this one initiative that made me join IQ and it's Chipta. Yeah, next slide. So Chipta is a nine weeks long pre-accelerator program designed for students to start and grow their business. IQ will also provide mentors and the necessary guidance to help develop their ideas into a minimum viable product. As mentioned earlier, being part of any student organization or volunteering movement, you are actually contributing to Malaysian grassroots community through the organizations in their own unique way. Therefore, I've decided to join IQN. It has been so far one of the best decisions I've made along my university life, which allows me to contribute to the Malaysian community. Also, besides many more personal gains, I, I think this alone shows how much you as an individual are able to contribute back to the nation. Yeah, next slide. And yeah, now I'll talk about my personal gain from being involved in extracurricular activities outside the classroom in IQ. So after nine months with IQ, I've come up with four value propositions, which translate to why you should also consider taking part in extracurricular activities. So first of all, developing and um, sharpening personal and professional skills. So this includes one, learning about yourself, your goals and your strengths. Two, developing soft skills. And three, yes, it looks good on your CV. So one of the many things I've personally learned as a head of region is to be able to think strategically. Being a strategic thinker doesn't just happen after one workshop or event. It's a skill that takes time to learn and IQ have, um, provides me the platform to sharpen this is invaluable skill. So next is the network and social opportunities. I have liars with companies like AirAsia, Sunway, and more in the corporate world, which might be very useful in my future career. And more importantly, building lifelong friendships with like-minded individuals in this kind of organizations. And the third point, which I've spoken about it earlier, is the contribution to the Malaysian community. And yeah, last but not least, a safe environment. And What's so great about student organization is that while you learn to use skills like project management, event planning, fundraising, you, you get to test them out in a safe environment where making mistakes is okay. Everyone is there to support you. So there's really no fear in messing things up or being wrong. So yeah, next slide. So lastly, how do you get involved in such opportunities? First of all, most of the student organizations are on social media and have their own websites. So you can always browse for the organizations whose vision aligns or interests you. For example, IQ UK is opening our recruitment drive next Monday. So you can always just go to Instagram and search for like, oh, IQ International, just no more. Yeah. So now if you couldn't find, could particularly find one that you yourself enjoy, well, you can always think about starting a new one with a group of friends. And secondly, I would say it's important to always be open to opportunities. Just take chances and explore because you will never know how perfect things can turn out to be. And lastly, watch for events or initiatives by a student organization as well as their recruitment drive. For example, through the events like this today, 
besides bringing away the knowledge that you are here for, you would also get to know more about the student organizations that organize them as well. This will expose you to more opportunities and maybe learn about their recruitment drive as well. Yep, next slide. Yeah, that's all from my presentation. So thank you so much for listening and feel free to reach out to me. Yep, thanks. All right, uh, hi everyone. My name is Yuan and I'm the co-executive director of Charisma Movement. Um, next slide, please. So basically before starting my presentation, I'd like to share your story. So one day, a journalist asked a billionaire, how, what is the secret behind your success? And the billionaire uh, passed an empty check to the journalist and asked the journalist to fill up whatever number she wants. Then journalist said, oh, I'm not about that. What I'm asking is what is the secret to your success? And then um, the billionaire offered the check again, but the journalist rejected again. Then for the third time, the billionaire just tore the check and then said, my secret to success is that I never let go any opportunities presented to me. You could have filled in the check and you could have been the richest journalist in the world, but you didn't take it. And that is a secret to my success. So I'd like to share a little bit about how as students involved in student organizations, we can actually get the most out of it by taking opportunities presented to us. All right, next slide, please. So uh, before I go, before I talk more about it, I'd like to just share a bit about Charisma Movement. We are actually a youth-led organization um, that encourage, that try our best to like volunteer in Malaysia to instill volunteerism and also leadership qualities in our youths. Uh, next slide, please. So some of the projects that we do, uh, there are three different parts of it. Inspire initiative, education, and also environment. Next slide, please. So, I was the Inspire Initiative Director in my first year in Charisma Movement in 2019. So what we do is basically to recruit a public proposal from um, anyone basically in Malaysia, as long as you can help the community in Malaysia. So you give us the idea and we help you with funding, publicity, the planning, the manpower, and basically to help you achieve your dreams. So like early on, we, uh, like the year before this, we actually had a sign language workshop. And before that, there was somebody who wanted to raise awareness on the importance of CPR. And we actually did manage to host the largest CPR demonstration in Malaysia. So just to give you an idea of like what, how it works. So next slide, please. So in 2019, what we wanted uh, for Inspire Initiative was we wanted to launch the YANA project, a breast and ovarian cancer campaign. And what I thought my job was to basically assist the project leader in terms of planning, budgeting, and to help them write the proposal. And then the rest of the project leader's team will take it from there and like host the whole thing. But guess what I ended up doing as well? Next slide, please. I, um, while being Inspire Initiative uh, Director, I realized that the recruitment process for a project was not very standard, uh, not very standardized. So I ended up revamping the whole public proposal recruitment process. I ended up also liaising with like speakers, looking for speakers. I helped with fundraising. I helped with doing some of the marketing. And these are the things that I did not see myself doing when I um, applied for the role. But what I'm trying to say in here is that um, there are always going to be things beyond what you're expected of, but if you are willing to take the opportunities to do it, you actually ended up doing things that, uh, you're actually doing more and you somehow learn a lot from it. Yeah, and next slide, please. Oh, okay, so this one. So since you wanted to launch the Yana project and we wanted it physical, but guess what happened? Um, the pandemic happened and so like we couldn't have it so what i did was i was presented an opportunity to join the wildlife conservation in um true charisma movement next slide please so i thought i was just going to volunteer uh, it's a physical trip i thought i was just going to volunteer and just fundraise but but guess what happened was i helped out with the marketing and next slide please so like marketing also comes with research and stuff and after the event itself i did writing because i did, i wrote i'm a blogger so i wrote about my trip and also to advocate. Then next slide, please. And 
for most of the volunteers, we even stayed back to continue um, with another new organization. And these are some of the things that we have done. So like to accept on the idea where the other, like just now there was this idea of like, if we, uh, what's it called again? White savior complex. Like you glamorize trips and stuff. I feel like it really depends on the individual whether the effort is continuous. So like, I feel like this is a very good like idea of like how you can continue with what um, you're passionate about. Yeah, so next slide, please. Yeah, basically these are just what I'm trying to say. So I hope you guys all the best. And if you like more information, next slide, you can find us on social media platform. Thank you. Hi guys, um, I'm Hajar from KPUM. I'm the uh, new director for corporate relations and outreach. And I just want to share some things about my, my journey, my very short journey to date in KPUM with you guys. The next slide, please. So first, it's just a quick introduction. KPM stands for Kesatuan Penuntut Undang-Undang Malaysia di UK dan Ayer. And we represent, uh, we are the umbrella body representing all law students studying English law in Malaysia and the UK. So um, our, main, our main defining points are that we are legal and we are corporate. So if, the, if there are law students or people who are interested in more corporate kind of structure and working culture, then KPM is definitely a place for you to do that. So in comparison to, other, to the other NGOs who have presented before, um, I can say that we're not really focused on the same kind of volunteering work. Um, it's more of the corporate culture and the, the kind of uh, fast paced, high drive working place that we can offer you. Okay, next slide. So these are just some of our values to unite, empower and uphold the rule of law and law students in their journeys. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, some history we established in 1979 and under the patronage of Lord Bingham and we consist of uh, the Malaysian board and also the executive committee in the UK. Next slide please. These are some of the events that we hold, including our flagship events and internship programs. So we will have Law Careers Convention, which is a large scale convention for law firms, legal education providers, and others to meet with law students and network, as well as internship programs, the theaters of summer beyond the bar and Asasi, which link law students and uh, interns to opportunities with law firms that we are in contact with. Stay at home is our, um, in light of the pandemic, we've arranged a few uh, webinars for law students to be able to catch up no matter where they are from around the world. Something that may be of interest to people who are interested in human rights and advocacy is the Idola Democracy Workshop where we brainstorm policy proposals and reforms in the area of law. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just some of um, the positions that are available within the executive committee. Um, as you can see, KPM is quite diverse in what and, and can meet your needs according to what you want to pursue. So for example, if you're interested in managing money, there's finance for you. If you want to reach out to corporations and do outreach to student affiliations, you can do what I'm doing, corporations and outreach. Skills enhancement and careers development is if you want to help law students um, set direction for themselves and learn skills that are going to be applicable to them in their workplaces. And of course, there's human rights and activism as well. If you're in, more interested in that sort of thing and would like to liaise with more NGOs and uh, do advocacy online, create pieces for people to read and educate themselves. And if you're just interested in uh, design and marketing, that kind of thing, there's media and communications as well. Next slide, please. And this is the same thing in the Malaysian board. Next slide. Okay, so um, I, have, I haven't gotten much experience yet because I've just undergone the shadow director program. But in general, uh, as I've mentioned before, what makes KPM stand out is corporate structure, which is accompanied by a very professional working culture. But within this as well, there's flexibility to develop. So it doesn't matter what 
it doesn't matter what uh, division you're in, what department you're in, there's always space to innovate and find out how to do things better and add value. Like um, you could set new directions, you could be very flexible and manage the welfare of your team as well. So I would say there's something in KPM for everyone, even by simply joining our events, you can learn a variety of skills. And um, the role is just what you make out of it. Um, next slide, please. So in corporations in, in particular, it's a very people-oriented job requiring patience, consistency, diplomacy, because you need to follow up with all these law firms and be very uh, consistent, organized, systematic, and have attention to detail in drafting sponsorship proposals. I think in closing, what I say about TPUM is that it's, it may be corporate, it may be quite structured and seem inflexible, but once you get into the role, once you start learning about what it does, there's a lot of space to grow and to network with uh, law firms, the corporate world, and fellow like-minded people among students. So it, it may not have as big as a social impact um, as, you, as you may be interested in, but if you want to develop your um, soft skills, your management skills, um, handling people's welfare, time management, being organized, then, um, and you're a very professional working kind of person, then this is definitely the place for you. And if you're, and next slide, sorry, if you're interested in joining us, the executive program is going to open up in uh, September, and we're taking applications for new executives in each of these departments. So please do um, join and see how much you can grow uh, based on your own ambitions. Uh, yeah, and just follow us here for more updates. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all student panels for enlightening us on what it's like to join different kinds of student organizations. So now move on to the panel session. So to the audience, if you have any questions for our experienced lineup of student panelists, do scan the QR code that will be shared on the screen or click the link in the chat box where you'll be directed to slido.com and drop your questions there. You may also upvote any questions you want to be directed to our speakers on the platform. So again, this panel session will be moderated by my colleague Yenru and I'll pass it over to her to start it off. All right, um, thank you Yenwei and our speakers here for all the lovely presentations. So I can't wait to explore further with our panel session and I'm sure our students oh. are too. So let's invite our lovely speakers back out first. So to kick, to kick off the panel session, I'll start off with a few questions of my own. So um, maybe we can start with Yuen. So what has been a personal challenge you overcame in your respective organization? I think, like, like I said, uh, um, uh, I see myself as a very opportunistic person. But at the same time, when the opportunity seems something out of my comfort zone, I still think twice about taking it. Um, like, sometimes like there is always like a voice saying that, oh, you should definitely do it, but it's something that I've never done before. So you, of course, feel a bit scared doing it. But at times like this, um, I look out, I reach out to like people who have done it before, and then we discuss about, you know, like the experience doing it. And... Uh, it somehow encouraged me to gain the confidence to try something new. So I feel like it's a very important thing to always reach out to people who have done something that you want to do. So you'll be able to understand better of um, the insights of how it's done. Yeah. Then you'll know better if it's for you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Yuan. Um, does anyone else want to chip in? Maybe Wei Yang? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, sure. So um, I think... Just uh, due to this online setting right now, um, I, I'm supposed to um, spearhead uh, like events such as like initiatives events to drive more recruitment application. And I think it has been a great challenge. So a lot of thinking and planning has to be done to make sure the event managed to garner enough attention to reach the target audience and to reach the targeted sign up. So um, I, was I, I thought beside hosting just another ordinary events that talks about oh I, how IQ, how good is IQ and everything, or just sharing insight, sharing question. I think I've decided to come up with something else that can add more value to my audience, something that would actually attract and interest them. So yeah, after plenty of research and thinking, I thought, well, why, why, not, why not I host a hands-on session that is more interactive to the audience and a session that the audience can immediately see the change and improvement after leaving the event. 
And so I've, I've decided to source for an industry professional to do a LinkedIn workshop, so um, which is very accessible and yet um, not fully explored by the students and utilized by the student community. So that would then allow my audience to at least learn a thing or two after uh, about how to brand themselves or build like greater connections. So I think being able to provide justifications for all the reasonings behind all these decisions made um, in event planning and yeah, I think um, fingers crossed. Um, I, I hope this uh, this will make uh, the future event that I've planned um, a, a very successful event and yeah, that will benefit both the audience and also achieve my objectives of um, organize, organizing such events. Yeah, that's pretty much me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's nice to see when you've made like a small impact. Um, maybe Hafiz, you want to take on the next question on, you know, um, as a student, you always have, you know, your academics and things like that to juggle on. So what keeps you motivated to stay in a student organization? Um, since Kalsum engage exclusively on students who are affected by education inequality, especially right now in the pandemic where the gap, where the education inequality gap deepens. I think my motivation would be that the fact that I was able to be involved in helping them to lessen the gap between education inequality. And there's this saying in the organization where, especially from the facilitators, where you come to inspire the students, but you left getting inspired. So that's the main motivation for me being in the organization. All right. Um, Hajar, you want to add on to this? Yeah, um, I would say that uh, what stands out to me about KPM is the fact that um, there's, an, there's a big room, room to grow. So, and also to engage with the professional kind of real life working culture and be very measured in the way you talk to firms and for me liaising with all these external organizations. So I think it's a good way also to show some initiative and set a new direction. Uh, the role is very flexible and it, it's just challenging you to see what you can do better with the day-to-day -day operations, um, small improvements and making things more efficient. And I think these are transferable skills that will help us a lot in the workplace. So, yeah. Yeah, all right. That's nice to hear. Um, maybe we'll move on to questions from the floor. Um, Ewan, you want to start off with the first question? How did the pandemic affect student organizations? Yeah, sure. Um, this year, we could only have like virtual events uh, in Charisma Movement. We have done like education and also environment um, projects physically before this, but having to change it to virtual, when we started, it was a bit of a hassle because we didn't know how the structure is going to be like, would people like the new way of doing it? But then um, as we had see through like number of, uh, a lot of meetings, um, we eventually found a way to not only engage with the audience, but also to uh, be able to benefit our beneficiaries and we found flexibility in the virtual in the virtual structure where we can do a lot of different things like for example for our current uh, this year's environmental project we were not only able to like work with three or four uh, ngos like usual but we were able to work with eight ngos so that is a flexibility that we are currently enjoying, but also the bad thing that we have faced is more towards like the education side because uh, we couldn't send our volunteers to Sabah, but fortunately we were able to found um we were able to find like um other organizations there which are willing to help us in terms of delivering um goods. Yeah, by the way, we are fundraising for them. So if you're interested to help, this is the time. Contact me later. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, because of the, you know, virtual space and things like that, a lot of things are much more accessible as well. So, um, Weyang, just now you mentioned as well, right, like um, how, you know, um, 
you wanted to think of, you know, how to make things more interactive and engaging. So how would you say, you know, the pandemic affected your organization? Yeah, so um, I personally believe that there's actually more positive uh, impact than negative impact, in my opinion. So um, before the pandemic, so um, I think um, the, the pandemic has created a more uh, inclusive environment for everyone. So like with all these kind of initiatives being done online, we are actually able to garner a larger crowd of our events and leave a positive impact to even more Malaysian student community. So for example, like we used to only host um, events that are meant for UK students and then Malaysia region will host for their own, their own region. So because of this pandemic, we're actually able to you know, collaborate amongst the um, executive committees within IQ and actually uh, conduct a rather bigger scale and a more global events and hence leaving um, a greater impact into the Malaysian community as a whole. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think um, here even today we have, you know, people from different backgrounds coming in. So for the next question, I think we address this. So maybe we can go on to the next one. Um, maybe Hafiz can answer this. Um, how does Calcium collaborate with other student organizations for volunteering events? Um, for camps, I don't really think so. But for other volunteering events, especially right now where a lot of the events are virtual, Calcium did collaborate with some student organizations. So in that, for the question thing, yes, for which especially for right now. Right. Okay. Um. Maybe I think the next question is also yours. So, can you explain the project management skill you managed to gain through calcium movement? I think just now you were cut off. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> because, due to time. Uh, I'll gonna, I'm gonna explain in the perspective of the calcium movement, uh, especially my role as calcium harapan director, which uh, a six months program for rural B40 youth. We just finished earlier this month, actually. We started in February, so it's a six month program. So you need uh, to consider five factors when engaging with rural B40 youth. Device, device storage, internet connection, student availability, and whether the environment is conducive, it's not. And given these factors or limitation, you need to cater the project to support or to complement this kind of limitations. That's the challenge. And that's the skills that you will learn as a director for the Cosmos camp. On top of that, because the camp is six months, you need to learn or you need to cater or devise activities or support activities to prevent or lessen the impact of virtual fatigue, especially to the facilitators and the beneficiaries, since the program is quite long. Mm, uh, definitely. Yeah, that's the general. Yeah. yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of thinking that needs to be, you know, um, done beforehand. So I think due to time constraints, those are the only questions that we can get. Thank you so much again to all of our panelists and our speakers. And, you know, I think we've all had a better understanding on how student organizations and, you know, all these volunteering experiences can help us, you know, further grow. So, um, Yanwei, back to you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you to the panelists and Yanwei once again for the lovely session. So as much as I want to hear more of what our panelists have to say, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our parallel session at the MSJ Submit 2021. So we hope you all enjoyed the session and have gained insights on how actively participating in extracurriculars can enhance your university experience. So do keep a lookout for any self-development opportunities out there for you. So once again, thank you to all our speakers and participants for engaging in this session. I think I'll pass it over to the MSG team for another photography session. Okay, so thank you KEC and all the speakers for attending our MSG summit. So, yep, I think we had a group picture just now, right? From the start. So yeah, it's all good now. So you guys can uh, go back to the main room, just click the leave room and leave the breakout room. Yep the blue color button. See you in the main room. Thank you.